Michelle Rigby was homecoming queen in Florida where she grew up. Back then, she never imagined that her witty smile would become one of her most disarming weapons in a world of espionage. When the CIA recruited me as an undercover agent, I began a secret life, hiding the truth about my job from friends and family, trusted with some of the nation's most sensitive tasks, sent to the most dangerous places in the world, working as a counterterrorism specialist to identify double agents and security threats, running from rockets in the middle of war zones, Told I couldn't possibly succeed because I'm a woman. Clinging to my faith to get me through. Her book is called Breaking Cover, Michelle Rigby Assad, My Secret Life in the CIA and What It Taught Me. And it's available wherever books are sold. And here she is with us. It's good to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Pat. How does a former homecoming queen wind up in the CIA? What happened? Oh, you know, I never dreamed of being in the CIA because I didn't even know that was a real job. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I had a passion for foreign affairs, mm -hmm. and I was able to go abroad on mission trips as soon mm -hmm. as I graduated high school, and one little baby step after the other, and I started developing an expertise on the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I got recruited out of Georgetown University. Into Will, Will you speak Arabic? Yes. Not fluently, but... <laughs> All right. You joined the CIA. How did you get into the CIA? Yeah, so it, it's fascinating because um, before September 11th, mm -hmm. which is when this occurred, uh, it was hard to get into the U.S. government as an Arab expert. Yeah. Um, and then at September 12th, of course, they were scouring the United States for, for people like my husband and myself. But we had already just gotten into the agency, gone through that very long uh, vetting process yeah. to get in, which is extensive. And then uh, we were brought in as uh, to be undercover counterterrorism officers. Well, did you go to the farm and go through all that training there? Yes, sir. Well, you had to go through all that. Yes, indeed. And you learned weapons training and physical... Yeah, so you have to take an entire year of tradecraft training mm -hmm. to make sure that you can keep your information safe, your sources safe, and, of course, you and your colleagues safe. Yeah. to carry out these clandestine operations. Well, they sent you to Egypt. Now, when you got to Egypt... You didn't tell people, I'm working for the CIA. Well, what did you say? So I actually didn't go to Egypt oh, for you, the agency, well, I, but all my studies were in Egypt. Okay. Yes. Well, where, where did you go with the agency? Uh, I'm allowed to say that I served in Iraq, yeah. and that's the only place I'm allowed to actually acknowledge. The rest of the locations are secret. Oh, they're secret. Yes. They still don't, don't want anybody to know about it. Indeed, but we spent a full 10 years in the region. Well, you were in Iraq, and, and, and what was your cover in Iraq? Um, we basically, I, I can't talk about cover issues. Oh, you can't. And, <laughs> okay. and if I do, I'd have to kill again. We don't want well, to do I that. Don't, so. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, no, but it was a very intense year um, in Baghdad because it was 2006 to 2007. Okay. So as you recall, that was a great surge. Yeah. And so we were working very hard to try to, say, to uh, protect a, Iraqi government and U.S. government and coalition forces um, uh, and from being targeted by both terrorists and insurgents there. So it was a, it was a you know, 12, 13, 14 an hour day job. Yeah. It's very exhausting. Well, you were an exhausting, uh, not really exhausted, but you were, you were supposedly a walking contradiction. What, what was that? Yeah, so it's fascinating when the CIA is looking to hire people. Mm -hmm. They're looking for people who are honest, Yet you are being asked to go out and tell a lie by um, having a cover that says one thing when you're doing another. Okay. Um, you are, they want people who love their country, but you're essentially being asked to move abroad and leave everything behind. Yeah. Family, friends, your country. And so they're looking for these people with these great contradictions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your husband, what's his expertise? Oh, Joseph is really fascinating. He is a Christian from Egypt yeah. who came to the United States uh, to get his college education when he was denied that education for his Christian activities in Egypt. Oh, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. 
But now, of course, he speaks Arabic fluently. He's a native Arabic speaker. And what's so fascinating about his background is he from, he's from a part of Egypt from which the, the roots of terrorist ideology come from. Mm -hmm. So he grew up with uh, you know, kids in high school whose parents were cell members in Gamat Islamiyya, the yeah. precursor to Al-Qaeda. So he was so familiar with this ideology and really, you know, suffered as a minority in that part of the world, but knew exactly what he was dealing with. Now, uh, again, I, I don't want to impose on secret stuff, but you were tasked with, with recruiting uh, agents or whatever you call them, mm -hmm. spies in the midst of that uh, yes. milieu. Tell us about that. It's such a fascinating process because what you're doing is you're trying to recruit someone who thinks you're the enemy. Yeah. And you're, the, you're, you're an American, you're CIA, you are um, an intelligence officer, so, and you're an infidel. So how do you get these penetrations of terrorist groups mm -hmm. to partner with you and they're risking their lives to do it, yeah. to give you the insider information you need to stop terrorist attacks from occurring. So you have this huge uh, bridge that you've got to get across in mm -hmm. order to make this connection with this guy who's a very unwholesome individual. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so getting being, being able to make that connection is a very interesting process because you've got to establish some modicum of trust, mm -hmm. you have to establish your bona fides, and as a woman, you have an extra added challenge of getting them past the gender issue. How did you do it? Ooh, emotional intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. So. so it's being able to understand where that person's coming from. Okay. So I had to understand his ideology, his worldview, his ideas of women, and I had to challenge them directly. And so I had to show these 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 guys, these insurgents, that I was I'm intelligent. I understand you and your culture. And then once I, once I had these conversations with them, I was recruiting them to okay. be my partner. Well, he, he didn't know you were CIA. Well, so they did at that point, they knew we were CIA. Oh, he did know you were CIA. Yes. So he knew you were recruiting him. He, he, yes, yes. Oh, he knew that he, they, they knew they were being pitched or they knew they were, being, they were talking to the CIA at that point. What, what was the come on? What would bring him in to, from what he's doing to working with us? That is such a good question. A lot of them just want money, yeah. want to get paid because it's a war zone, it's a non-functioning economy. Some of them no longer buy into the ideology anymore. Okay. They have had it. I don't, I don't believe this. Um, some of them are in it because they want to be, they want to off their competition Oh. And they want to become the big terrorists, but they pretend like they're doing good. So they have a variety of motivations that, that, um, that bring them in to work with the CIA. And I always say, I don't care what the motivation is, but I have to know what it is, yeah. because then I have to work that. You had to be sympathetic to, I mean, you had to understand their ideology. Yes. Yeah. And see them as human beings. Yeah. Because if I don't fundamentally understand you as a human being, I'm not going to be able to make that connection. Well, who did you get? Can you talk about uh, who your, your client was or your, your target? Um, bad guys. The bad guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you got a bad guy and, and he, he turned and he was working for us? Yeah. So it's fascinating because what they're doing is they're saying, look, my group is planning A, B, and C. We're planning to carry out a car bomb attack or we're, we're, um, here's our, the location of our safe house where we keep our, our weapons. And so they would give you this information. Then we would package it, disseminate it to the intelligence community, and that would enable our special forces brethren to action those targets. So you actually, I mean, was it only once that you did that or many, oh, many times? Constantly. Constantly. Yeah, and what's so fascinating about working in a war zone is everything is kind of, it's like on speed. It goes so quickly. And so car bomb one hour, next hour, it's a IED buried in the road. And then two hours later, you're dealing with a safe house location. Come so on. it's just constant. And it's fascinating. And, and these guys would tell you all of these things. I mean, there's an IED at... at Checkpoint, so and so. Right. And, but you have to be so careful because you also don't want to release information that's going to put them in danger. Sure. Because if they're identified as the source of the information, well, they'll, they'll be kill. killed. So, you, so they have to trust you that you know how to handle their information securely and you're not going to get them killed. Well, they were turned off by the ideology or, or the brutality of the. Uh, Terrorists. Sometimes, sometimes it, they were, some of the guys. And some still bought into the terrorist ideology. Was anything noble about what they thought? 
A, a few of them had really noble motivations. There were a couple that we worked with that said, I've been a terrorist for years. Yeah. I've been blowing people up and killing others, and I feel so empty inside, and I don't like this feeling, and I realize I've been used by this terrorist organization. Yeah. And I'm not doing it anymore. Were you able to share the Christian faith with any of them, or did you try? That, that Unfortunately, no. We weren't in a position to be able to do that. Yeah. But you just hope that your interaction with someone who's assuming you're a Christian is going to be planting some seeds. Well, why did you finally get out? Ooh, we were exhausted. You were you? <laughs> so this is 10 years being abroad, not getting to see your family very often. Mm -hmm. You're missing out on life. Um, you're working holidays, weekends, constantly. And so you can only do that for so long before mm. you're, you're burnt and you're out. And you just exhausted. Yeah, we were, we were exhausted. Plus, um, I heard the call of God to write this book. Okay. And to share our story to inspire well, did others. Did you have to get this vetted through the CIA? Oh, yes. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Did, did yes, you redact but, um, a whole lot of it? Or you... Just a few things. Yeah. Um, but it's amazing what they actually let you say. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they allowed me to really open up this, this secret world for people to see what it's like on a daily basis to be a counterterrorism officer. How's the book going? Is it successful? Fabulous. Is it yes. really? Yeah, and it's so exciting to watch um, because after being undercover, yeah. I had no social media. Yeah. I had no social platform, and I was kind of an unknown. So for the book to come out and do so well, it's a huge blessing. Well, we appreciate you writing it and being here. Breaking Cover, there's one movie called Breaking Bad. This is Breaking Cover. It's available wherever books are sold. And thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. God Appreciate bless you. It. It's been fun talking to you. Indeed. All right. You heard it here, ladies and gentlemen, a CIA undercover operative for 10 years in the Middle East in the midst of the war zone. Unbelievable.